ओके कैन हियर मी यस यस सो यस हेलो गुड इवनिंग गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबॉडी सो माय नेम इज अरबी रस्तम आई एम द डायरेक्टर ऑफ एकेडमिक क्वालिटी एट हगुत वाट यूनिवर्सिटी दुबई कैंपस सो ऑन बिहेल्फ ऑफ हगुत वाट यूनिवर्सिटी द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ सिविल इंजीनियरिंग एंड द इंस्टीट्यूशंस ऑफ सिविल इंजीनियर्स आई वुड लाइक टू वेलकम यू ऑल to this cbd event with engineer anas al akhras and uh, dr al akhras will share with us his experience on historic uh, preservation so thank you for joining us uh, mr anas and uh, the floor is yours thank you thank you dr rabia um good afternoon good evening everybody um i thank dr rabia for his invitation and Harriet Watt Dubai for their kind invitation for this seminar. Um, the time here in the US is 11 a.m. It's 7 p.m., so different time zones. So good evening, everybody. My name is Anas al -Akhras. I'm gonna be talking today about an introduction to historic preservation. Few um, information about myself. I have a master's degree from California, from San Jose State University. I'm a civil engineer, so the historic preservation is usually for architects, but I will make sure that I go through both aspects of architectural and civil engineering um, concepts. I'm a member of ACI committees 440, 423, and 546. I'm also a member of Association for Preservation Technology, Washington DC chapter. And this association, by the way, um, APT has also international association. It's called International Association for Preservation Technology. Anybody can join um, from outside the USA. I'm a member also of the National Trust for Historic Reservation. I'm also a registered professional engineer in Texas and Maryland here in the US. I work as an independent consultant in USA and Middle East beside my full-time job, with it, which is um, senior project manager and technical manager for a contracting company in the US. Um, my specialty is in repair, strengthening, and restoration. I'm also certified post-earthquake damage assistant um, from California Office of Emergency. The content of the lecture will talk about historic structures, we'll talk about historic building materials, the role, role of the historic preservation consultant, common deterioration of historic structures, how to do testing of historic material, BIM applications in historic preservation, common repair techniques, and we'll finish with one or two case studies. What is historic resources? Historic resources, as a definition, is a district site building subject or an object that is significant in the history. Um, due to its architectural, due to its engineering, archaeology, the culture, and it is significant to the location it is in, to communities or the country. Examples of historic structures, the most famous one is the pyramids in Egypt. Um, another historic structure um, in the area of um, the Gulf area, which is Bahla Fort in Oman, was built 3000 BC. Alhambra Palace in Spain is built in 1300 AD. Al Fahidi Fort in UAE was built in 1787. Al Jahiri Fort in UAE, also this is an Al Ain, was built in 1891. You can see the amazing structure of this fort, and we will be having a case study about it at the end. And this fort, um, by the way, was um, restored, rehabilitated to be a museum um, for tourists. Another example of historic structure is the Union House, which was built in 1965 and was rehabilitated um, later on um, in 2014 and 15 to become um, the Etihad Museum. And we'll also talk about it. 
from the USA, um, the, in the Washington DC, the Simpsonians, which is basically the most of the museums in DC that are all considered historic. This is an example of a project uh, I'm working on at right now. It's a freer gallery of art where we're doing repair and cleaning for the facade work at the exterior of the building and also at the interior of the building. What are the organizations that deal with um, historic structures or heritage? UNESCO, they have a list. They call it World, World Heritage List. If you go to the list, you can see on a map, um, cultural site, natural sites, mixed use sites, and anything, any site that is in danger is marked in red. They have also World Heritage Convention that they do every year. Other organization local in um, UAE is the ICC ROM, which is International Center, Center for the Study of Pres for Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property. Their main office is in Sharjah, and they are very well active um, um, in the UAE. The most important one here in the US is the National Park Services. National Park Services was established back in the 50s and 60s. They have, this is their website. They have something called National Register. If you go to the National Register, they give you a list of all the historic places in the US based on the state and the city you're living in. And any historic place that is in the National Register of National Park Services, it will be tagged as this one to say, this has been listed in the National Register of Historic Places by the United States Department of the Interior. And the United States Department of the Interior has also good um, resources about historic preservation. And the most important one is this one. This is the standard, the security of the interiors standard for treatment of historic properties. Um, it has guidelines for preservation, for rehabilitation, for restoration and reconstruction of historic buildings. Their website is very rich of guidelines. They provide an assistant and aid um, for um, focusing on four treatment standards, which is the preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, and reconstruction. Each section in the National Register and the MPS and the Secretary of the Interior Standard um, has um, rules and standards for each kind of um, um, repair we are, we are dealing with for historic structures. This is their website. If you go to the website of uh, the Secretary of the Interior Standard, you can see here on the right, important links. All these links, they are standards for preservation, for rehabilitations, for restoration and reconstruction. Um, they are all PDFs and free to be downloaded. These are the main standards here that we use in the US and it provides very detailed guidelines on how to repair or how to deal with historic properties. What is historic preservation? Historic preservation is the practice of protecting and preserving sites, structures, um, or districts that they have um, history, they have social, economic, political, um, archeological history. So the, basically there are any item, place, or building that have architectural or cultural significant significance and it is important for the area that this um, building or structure is in. What is preservation? This is all from the Security, Secretary of the Interior Standards. They define, define preservation as the act of or process of applying measures to sustain the existing form of a historic property. So basically they're looking for protection and stabilizing the property um, in its 
current condition by doing ongoing maintenance and repair. It does deal with limited upgrade for mechanical, electrical, and plumbing system if needed, but it does not deal the preservation. It does not deal with adding new exterior additions um, to existing structure. It require retention of the greatest amount of historic fabric along with the building historic form. So preservation is trying to keep the condition of the structure stable and protected for longer period of time. That's the end of preservation. The standards for preservation as per um, the Secretary of Interior standards, there are 10 standards. Um, I'm gonna list them all here very quickly. Um, number, standard number one, the property should be used for its, its historic purpose. Um, minimal changes will be done to the property. This is the most important thing. Do not change um, the property um, if you are doing preservation. You can do that if you're doing rehabilitation or restoration work. Um, the character, the historic character of the property should be retained and preserved. Do not remove any historic material. Do not alt alter any historic material or spaces. Um, the property should have a physical record of its time, place, and use. Usually here in the US, each property that is listed in the National Register has a record archive uh, to show when it was built and by who and which material was used. Um, do not add to it additional elements. Um, do not fake it. Do not um, add things to the property and say it is part of the historic um, component of the property. Most properties, they change over time. These changes should ha that have acquired historic significance shall be returned and preserved. You know, if you have a building that was built a thousand years ago, um, 200 years after that, somebody added to it, it, it be becomes part of the um, building, um, somebody has to track the changes over the time. So it has at the end um, a history for it. Distinctive, distinctive features, finishes, and construction techniques shall be reserved. And we will show an example in a few slides after this. Um, deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced. This is a very important aspect in preservation. Do not demolish, do not replace, do not take out and put a new one. Try always to repair what, whatever you have by any means and methods. Um, chemical or physical treatments such as sandblasting that can cause damage to historic material shall not be used. So when dealing with historic preservation, do not use abrasive cleaning, do not use chemical that hurt or damage uh, the material that is used in building. So you should be use, using the gentlest means possible when doing their preservation. Any uh, significant resources in the project affected by a project shall be protected. If you're doing repair for a building and you have some um, archaeological resources inside the building, while you're doing the repair, you should cover it up and protect it um, so it, it, it is not disturbed or damaged. Um, if in case somebody wants to add to it at a later stage, when you're doing addition, do not destroy the historic material and characterize it of the property. And this is important um, because sometimes, you know, even though that we want to preserve the historic nature of the building, due to um, accessibility, we have um, site access to the building. We need to create a ramp that is mandatory as per ADA requirement. If you wanna add that one, uh, make sure that when you add it, you do not destroy the historic material of the property. 
Uh, what is the defining character defining features? Character defining feature is the visual aspect and physical element that compromise that comprise the appearance of the historic building. I give you an example here, which is this turret. This is turret or a tower um, that shows the shape of the building or structure. This is um, called character defining features. If you wanna know um, what is the, uh, the character defining features in any building you are working on, you make um, a thorough building survey and you make a list of a priority uh, for the features included in the buildings. This is an example from um, Jahiri Fort. And you make a list as a historic preservation or a specialized uh, architect um, for the features that they are highly significant. These should always be protected. The features that are significant should be carefully repaired if necessary or replaced if, if really needed. And the feature that are, they are non-significant or altered, you can remove it and replacement um, anytime. Example of character defining features. This is one of the projects um, that I was working on a few years ago. This is the Simpsonian Institution building. They call it the castle. It was built in 1847. You can see on the photo on the left, the landscape. The landscape for this building is considered a character defining features. In other words, you need to preserve it. You need to protect it and not, do not change it. Um, the facade stones, the Seneca sandstones you, sa you can see on the right, is also considered a character defining feature for this building. So we talk about preservation. Rehabilitation is another aspect of historic preservation. Rehabilitation is basically um, is the act or process of making possible a compatible use for a property through repair alterations and additions by pres preserving those portions or features which convey its historic culture or architectural value. So the rehabilitation standard does acknowledge the need to alter or add to a historic building to meet continuing or new, use new uses while retaining the building historic character. So by doing rehabilitation, um, if there is a need, the building is small, you need to add to it. Uh, you need to change the interior of the building because of change of use, then you go to rehabilitation work. But when doing the rehabilitation work, we try to retain um, and make sure that the historic character of the building remains. This is an example for a project here in the US where you can see on the left-hand side photo, um, the historic building which is used by um, one of the local governments here, one of the states, they needed to extend it. So they added a new addition, this small portion building, they added to it. Um, you can see when they added um, a building to it, they try to match the existing one um, by the color, by the material, and they try even to match the windows style, if you can see. When you do additions to historic buildings, it is very important to differentiate between the historic building and the addition. Usually have a plaque here or a card on the addition to say this is addition done in the year um, 1970 or 1980. Um, so it does differentiate the addition from the historic building that you added to it. This is another, another example here in the US. I'm working on this project right now. It's in Washington, DC. You can see this is the small building, this project called Arlo. This is the historic building that is in place. Um, a client 
purchase this property and they want to add to it this a new building. And this is how the structure would look like. Uh, part of the process of doing this addition, they want, of course, emphasize on the historic portion of this whole building. They're going to do um, rehabilitation work here and restoration work to repair the old one, then add to it this new building here. Restoration work, it is basically trying to restore uh, the material or the elements to its original condition or original history. Um, if, if we try to preserve the material, repair it, it doesn't work. You have to replace it 100%, then you go to uh, restoration work. When you do a restoration for a material, you make sure that you restore it to the original condition, like it was built. And one of the ways to know how it was built it is going through the historic archives, um, earlier um, photos or area description um, for the building or, or um, site. And you try to depict the building at its particular time um, limit. We have seen projects here in the US that were built um, in 1850, um, in 1950, uh, they changed the exterior cladding for the building um, because of weathering. When we are back now to um, do restoration work for it, we were asked to return the building to the period that was built in, which is the 1850 not to the period where it was modified in 1950. So the restoration work tried to depict the building when it was built. Reconstruction is basically um, making new construction, new features of the building. Um, let's say there was a staircase and the staircase is gone. They, somebody took it out or is heavily damaged you can construct a new staircase with the building. So these are the four uh, features that are listed in the security of the interior. If you wanna go through the preferred sequence of work, this is good flow chart for you. If the historic feature is intact and good condition, you try to preserve it with regular maintenance to maintain its integrity. If it is deteriorated or damaged, uh, repair it to its original condition. If the repair is beyond, um, is the, if the member is beyond re repair, then replacement uh, is allowed, but is only permitted for portion or for a feature that cannot be reasonably repaired. When you do repair or when you do a replacement for the feature, it has to be replaced in kind. Replace in kind means you use the same material, the same details, and the same finish. This is very important in dealing with historic structures. When you do a replacement, you have to match existing. And we'll talk about matching at a later stage. Reconstruction, if all part of the historic feature is missing, then you reconstruct it based on appropriate evidence, such as photographs, or features from um, historic books or historic records or similar adjacent properties that were built at the same period of time. The importance of historic preservation. This is very good flow chart to show you the importance of asset management. So when the property was built at the beginning, the performance hits to the optimum performance level, then by time it goes down. If you apply to it normal maintenance work, then the chart will go smooth until it hits the minimal accepted, acceptable performance. If you don't preserve it and you don't apply maintenance and repair work for it, then the structure will start to deteriorate and will go the service life 
will go down, will go faster. You start losing um, the service life of the structure. And this is irreversible. You cannot reverse it back. So this is the importance of having preservation, put plans put in place uh, to deal with historic structures. You are extending the design service life of the structure when you do uh, repair and maintenance for it. What are the historic building materials that were used um, from the earlier ages? Masonry. So here in the US, they considered these elements as part of the masonry description. So stone, adobe, brick, mortar, and terracotta, they are all considered masonry material. We know about the stones. Adobe uh, will show you some pictures. It is sun-dried clay. The bricks are also clay, but they are kiln, kiln fired at very high temperature. The mortar is known and the terracotta is basically assemblies of um, clay that is used on the exterior of the building to provide protection. Beside masonry uh, material, there are historic metals, steel, iron, all historic metals that were used back in the days. Wood is one of the oldest material that is used in construction, glass, um, concrete, plaster and stucco, paints and coatings, they are all considered um, historic materials when, it, when they were applied. An example for historic building material, which is the stone, this is Busra, if you are from Syria, it's uh, south of Syria. It was built in 2000 BC. This is um, built by, by the Romans. And you can see all this, um, amazing stones that is still remain 2000 plus years after it was built. Another example of stones, this is um, Umayyad mosque in, uh, in Damascus. You can see the stone arches here um, in the, the entrance of the mosque. Example of adobe material. Adobe is, by the way, um, called in Arabic tub. It's basically um, a brick that is composite, uh, made of earth, mixed with water and organic material such as straw or dung. This is the dried under sun. This is the oldest material that was used um, and early days, because it's easy to be formed, you can see you can use wooden um, forms and you can make it and you can just sun dry it. Example of a building that used this adobe material, um, the Great Mosque of Jenny in Mali. You can see the amazing shapes. Another kind of material is the concrete. Um, the concrete was used 3000 BC in Egypt and China. It was not really a concrete. They used um, Egyptian mortar and mortar of lime in the pyramids of Giza. So one of the uh, important material that makes the pyramids stay until today is the mortar they used in the pyramids. Um, in Rome, the, the Roman uh, Empire, the ancient Roman, they did um, use and upgrade the uh, mortar and cement that was invented before them. They added to it um, volcanic ash, lime, and seawater to form the mix. And then they would pack it and mix it into wooden forms. Once hardened, they stack it in blocks like brick. So the Roman concrete structures after almost 2000 years now they are still tall and standing. Um, and if you visit Italy, you will see all this um, amazing structures there that were built early days. The pyramids, while uh, the pyramids were constructed from bricks made from mud and straw, the adobe bricks, the mortar used between the bricks were created from gypsum and lime. And they used uh, the technique of heated limestone which would harden and set much like modern cement mortars. 
The Romans, as I said, they use a mortar and their concrete where they use the combined pozzolans, uh, the fine volcanic ash that is available in Italy. They add to it lime and water. Um, here in the US, probably the most known reinforced concrete building that was built in Cincinnati in the USA. It was built in 1903. It's called uh, the Ingalls Building. It's the world's first, first reinforced concrete high rise building. Um, it spans 16 stories, around 54 meter tall. And it is a feature of engineering for the time. You can see it's robust and um, it stood for all these years with uh, minimal repair required. Another example for um, historic building material is the wood. This is a photo from uh, Al Ula project in, in, uh, in KSA, um, where you can see they're doing restoration work in addition to um, repairing the woods that they were used before. Um, and it comes very important of hiring and historic preservation consultant to lead um, all these efforts. So the historic building consultant or historic preservation consultant, um, they have the expertise to do due diligence review and appraisal of the property. So that's the first thing that um, when you bring a specialist consultant to your property, the historic property, they do their appraisal uh, to identify and address potential risk, which is very important. Um, risk management is the most important thing that the historic consultant should do because um, the building may not be in a good shape. It might be deteriorated and lost its structural capacity. Um, so they should address the potential risk and issues of concern. Um, and it should also address the limitations or opportunity of converting the, the building. So the benefits of having a historic uh, preservation consultant, um, you increasing the likelihood of a timely successful process you are obtaining more accurate and reliable information. You are identifying and documenting adjustments and with positive financial impact, uh, the historic preservation consultant will be preparing a team for uh, likely question raised by investors or owners um, when it comes to application. So not only they are involved at um, the early stages of the project, but also they are involved also um, in the application of the construction work if um, preservation or rehabilitation is required. They sh should have uh, the knowledge to, and experience to do risk management um, and also considering the historic nature of the building. How, how to be a good historic preservationist? We not only need to know how to preserve and protect the historic building, but also they have to be able to research. And this is an important aspect in historic preservation. Um, most of the time you get a structure or a building that has no material information, no as built, um, um, nobody knows anything about it. The importance of the consultant is to go through all the history of the building, um, try to get information from um, local government, from the city, from any type of um, culture or heritage agencies that they dealt with, um, with these structures, either the building itself or uh, similar ones. Um, one of the projects I'm working on right now, I'm going to show it in the later slides. It's a project for uh, Army Corps of Engineers. We had to go through the archive of the Army Corps of Engineers and dig into um, who was the engineer in charge when it was built. And based on researching um, the historic information about the engineer, we came to know that 
he liked to use certain type of uh, stucco or plaster. He used basically um, the natural hydraulic lime or the natural cement lime in the, his application. So it was easy uh, for us to know which type of plaster or stucco we are applying on the building. So in addition to know all this information about the history and how to preserve the structure, they have to know also how to do diagnosing for the structure, how to do sounding, how to track and trace the cracks, if any, um, how to um, consider the structure as a whole. And if you want to be a good historic preservationist, you should be part of you historian, part geologist, part lawyer, and part chemist in order to do something as simple as clean the building facade. You should have acquired all this knowledge when making decisions. Um, here in the US, if you're doing with the historic structure and you're doing rehabilitation or restoration work for that structure, um, there are multiple layers of approval um, that you need to deal with. You need to deal with um, the traceries, which is basically the consultants hired by the government to look for and to look after the historic structures. You need to deal with the architect. You need to deal with um, historians to make sure that your restoration work and rehabilitation work as are as per their standards. So what are the documents for historic preservation? As I said, collecting the historic data, data is very important. Collecting information about material properties, either from the historic data or by doing testing. Um, as built and design drawings, if there is any. So we're not talking about structure that was built, built thousand years ago, but also structure that are recent are 100 year or 70 years old. Um, architectural drawing, design specification, if there's any repair drawing that was um, available or done a few years ago, then you look for this information. And if there's any alteration drawing, you look for it also. This is an example of um, one of the projects that was done in the 90s in Syria. Uh, they took out all the um, stones on top here. They photo documented the stone pieces. They numbered the stones. They put their measurements. They put it down here in the um, 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 lay down area here. And after they repaired the stones, they fixed it. They put it back. Uh, as we are the labeling, they're going to they took it off. This is another example where our project was working on here, um, or not here, in Dubai. This is the Union House. Um, before taking or doing any repair work inside the union house, they were photo documented. We, we collected thousands of photos um, to make sure that when we put it back or when we repair it, we put back to the condition it was there before. This is a project I'm working on right now. This is the logo of the US Army Corps of Engineers. Um, as you can see the complex nature of the building, uh, you cannot just go and measure it because there was no as built for this building. So we hired um, Dewberry Company. They brought the uh, Leica scanners, the P40 and BLK360. After they did the laser scanning, um, point cloud data was processed using uh, the Cyclone software. And the result is um, this image and other images. Uh, when they did the laser scanning, you know, they gave us three models in AutoCAD. You can open the file, rotate the building, see all the dimensions and measures. What is very important here is the reference points that you can see here. If you want to have a section cut or you want to uh, go back to the same um, area that they have done, these are the reference points that they did uh, mark when they did the survey. Um, this photo is not very clear, but you can see here um, the shapes of the stucco. So if you look at the castle itself, you can see these lines. This is, these are stucco or plaster. They are cut into blocks. 
So they were able to identify the blocks uh, very accurately and even give us a measurement for each block uh, dimension wise. And they will be able to give us also thickness of the stucco or plaster applied. Causes of decay in historic structures, it's either uh, common threats to historic sites, external causes of decay, biological and bot botanical causes, natural disasters, and man-made cause of delay of decay. And this is an example of man-made decay. You can see from this photo, this is a very good example. Uh, the bricks here, they were uh, stuccoed or plastered with cementitious material. That cementitious material made the water up between the brick and um, the cement. In other words, when there's moisture inside the building and the moisture wants to evaporate through the bricks, it should, the brick has to be able to breathe. Since somebody introduced this cementitious stucco on, on the outside, it prevented the bricks from breathing. It trapped the moisture between these, um, the bricks and the stucco. And the result was the bricks losing their fire skin, which is the protection and preservation for the brick, and it start losing some of the section. There's another example of man-made decay. Um, somebody tried to paint the bricks with latex paint. The latex paint is not a breathable paint. They should have used lime wash based material. Um, if you ask me what could have been done here, we, they should have um, applied natural uh, hydraulic lime plaster or natural cementitious plaster, which allow the, breathe, uh, the bricks to breathe. Another cause of deterioration is the fluorescence, which is exposure um, to um, environment. This is a salt that comes to the surface. Um, example of repairs. Um, this is an example of stone that was repaired. It was missing these pieces. Pieces were added to give it the original uh, condition. Bad repairs of masonry. You can see here, somebody tried to fill it with foam. When they did the, the mortar joints here, instead of matching the color of the mortar, they decided to use a mortar that does not match the color. And this is bad repair. There's another bad repair, which is using new bricks here and new stone here that does not match the color. As I told you before, color matching is very important when dealing with historic structures. Um, how to do color matching here in the US, we have um, samples that are ready. You can take it, you place it against the wall and you can match the color either for the bricks or stones or any kind of material you're using. This is an um, example from our lab. You can see we did hundreds of samples to see which color would match. And by the way, when you do the color matching, you don't wait for three days or seven days. You wait for a few weeks or a few months until the color matches. Um, we start with small patches of this size, but um, all the projects that I've been dealing with the consultant or the client ask for big patches to be applied and see their performance over a period of time that can go to six months or one year until the color settles and they match the color with the existing one to make sure it matches. This is the ready kit for uh, mortar. You can see all um, colors of mortar. You can pick from this kit and apply it and see if it matches your color. In terms of uh, retrofit and strengthening techniques, this is for structural engineers that are um, possibly more interested in this details than architects. Um, one of the repair and strengthening techniques, if the, the structure is failing, you can add reinforced elements either to one side or two sides or introduce a new columns in the adjoining area. Um, you can use uh, metallic tie rods, you can see the structure uh, was tied in by using uh, tie rods or pre-stressed bars in both directions. 
This is an example for an, um, an arches, 324 arches, where they will use steel beams embedded in concrete um, in this area here. Um, this is an example for using FRP, fiber reinforced polymer, a carbon fiber uh, material, where they strengthen the dome by using the FRP. They use also FRP for masonry walls. Um, I'm going to skip this one. I'm going to show you the next one, not this one. So this deals with um, um, bricks. If you want to strengthen or want to stitch that cracks in bricks, you use uh, helical ties. These helical ties, what they do is basically you embed it in the mortar. It's only four or five millimeters. If you have a crack like this one that goes this way, um, it can um, stitch the cracks. Another example is um, if you don't want to stitch the cracks like this, you can drill um, through the mortar. Let's see this through the motors and instead of um, spanning horizontally, you can span um, inside the, the building. You're basically tying in um, the exterior wall to a solid structure behind it, either it's stone or concrete by um, stabilization for the structure. Um, this is how you embed the tie. And by this mechanical embedment, you should be able to tie the this wall to the existing one and you apply patch to it. Last is the case study. It is a case study from UAE. It was done by um, years ago for the charity for was done by specialist um, architectural. Um, Dr. Rabir, can you hear the sound or no of the video? No, the video, no sound for the video. Okay, no sound. So I'm gonna mute it. Um, the text is written here in Arabic and English, but basically um, this project for the Jari uh, Ford Let's see if I can skip. This is the architect for the building. What they basically did, they provided um, cooling cubes to the exterior walls for the building to preserve it. They also provided um, some ventilation elements when they did the restoration work and rehabilitation work, it is very important to reuse traditional materials. So when you're dealing with historic preservations, you try to use, you either try to salvage the material. So if you're taking stone pieces, you try to fix the stone pieces and you put them back. So you salvage the material and re reuse it. If you're not, if you cannot salvage them, then you try to reuse traditional material that is available on site. You can see here they did the clay. Um, from, they added to it straw. They also, this is the, the bricks, the clay bricks in the, inside the wall, the adobe bricks. And they did uh, the restoration work um, for this um, project. Unfortunately, you cannot hear the voice, but um, you can hear read the text and see what they have done. I will provide you with the link for this uh, video after we're done with this presentation. And we conclude the presentation here. I had to rush it because I know we have only one hour. So these are the, present, the references I used is the Secretary of the Interior Strand Standards for Treatment of Historic Properties. Um, there's a standard for rehabilitation. There's also um, NPS standards, the case study from for the Etihad Museum Union House um, is one of the 
case studies I used. Jahari Ford, the refurbishment, conversion, and repair was done by Roswag and Jan Kovisky Architects. And last, the laser scanning for the Georgetown Castle that I showed you was done by Dubery. Thank Any you. questions? Thank you, Engineer Anas, for the interesting uh, presentation. And now we'll use the next. 10 minutes for questions and answers. So please, if you have any question, please either raise your hand or type the question in the chat. Okay, the text was from Muhammad yeah, Mazaz. He has a question about seismic hazards, such as the in, in Turkey. Okay, so I'm assuming that he's talking about historic um, structures that they were damaged or they are um they, they were damaged during the earthquake um but as general repair they are so as i said um uh, part of the certificates that i have is the post earthquake damage assessment um certificate uh basically if you are interested in this i can give you more details if you can um uh, send me on the email but there are ways Yes, there are ways to repair and restore structures without compromising the historic value, uh, depending on the level of damage. If the damage is minor, then just trying to replacing the elements. And of course, when you do the replacement, you need to make sure that it's um, shored and supported very well when you do that. Um, um, if you're dealing with um, repair, or damage that is beyond repair, you have to replace the element. Um, you have to match the elements that you have. If you're dealing with stone buildings, um, in particular, the stones usually is the um, is considered the load bearing walls for these structures. Um, what we have done in the past, um, besides replacing the stone piece that is cracked or damaged. We applied a mesh, uh, which is half a centimeter or one centimeter of stucco or plaster on the outside with a chicken mesh behind it. And that give, give um, um, good diaphragm action when it's applied from the outside or from the inside. So it's, it's a general question. I can give you a general answer. If you have more, um, more details, you can share with me on that. Yeah. So. A question from Mohammed Afzal is asking if we can share the presentation. I will try to share the presentation with um, or taking out the information that's related to um, some projects. Yes. Okay, so if you can send it to us and we will share it with the audience. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Maria Musa, is conservation considered as a big umbrella of historic preservation techniques? So and um, this is a good question. So conservation usually deals with material aspects while preservation deals with um, protection and stabilization. So in other words, conservation and preservation, they are both equal sort of. Um, there are some um, master program, programs here in the US, they call it historic preservation and some of them they call it historic conservation but they're the same concept. There's very thin line difference between them. Okay, another question. Uh, thanks for the presentation. So we are looking for more detail about structural enhancement techniques. Okay. Well, I've done lectures before on structural enhancement techniques. Um, I will arrange with you, Dr. Rabia, in the future if we can do that. You are more than welcome. Thank you. So what is, what is your opinion about nanomaterials? Um, what kind of nanomaterial 
she is referring to Maryam. Okay, so Maryam, please clarify in the comments, please. And how we will deal with the historical buildings with terms of structure and design? Okay, so it is very important to um, to engage not only the architect but also structural engineer or license engineer uh, when dealing with historic buildings. Uh, they come to site, they see the structural um, um, elements, the structure frames, um, what is basically the load bearing elements of the building. And then after that, they work with the architect to develop repair or restoration uh, solution for the problems. Okay, so Maria explain restoration and repairing materials of stone as an example. Okay, for so usually for stone repairs, they either there are two ways. Way number one is uh, patch patching the stone, which is basically uh, cutting the piece of the stone and patch it or Dutchman repairs. Now, there have been some materials in the market that, um, that are newly available, uh, but the research on the material, uh, it depends on, um, are they tested for long-term long -term, uh, durability or it's only for few months or few years? Um, so Mariam, if you have a specific material that you wanna ask about, you can, um, you can send me by email. Any other question? Do you have any more questions? Okay, if not, uh, I'm conscious of, uh, of the time. Uh, thank you all for attending this uh, event, the CBD event, and I would like to invite you all for our future monthly CBD uh, events. So you can follow us on our uh, LinkedIn uh, uh, or uh, so social media. And I want on your behalf to thank uh, Mr. Anas for this interesting uh, presentation. So on behalf of Harvard Watt University and the Institution of Civil Engineers, I would like to thank you all and wish you a happy evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for everybody. Thank you. Have a good one. Good day. Thank you.